Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along. I really appreciate it. This is fantastic for me because I only live just round the corner, and so it's great to come along here today. One of the things I wanted to do was to look at some of the things that I've spotted financial advisors and financial planners doing in recent years. But the more I looked at it, I realised that today is not so much about, in terms of what I'm talking about, more about things that you can do, but to think about more about yourself and to look closely at yourself and who you are and what you represent uh, as a person and what you can bring to the party in terms of your financial planning business. 41 years ago today, I took that photo at the Hampstead Podium in London of heavy metal band Judas Priest. They are still going strong today. Right now, they're in Northern Canada, I think, doing a show. At the time, I was 17, 18, I was about 18, something like that, and I was really enjoying photography. Photography was in my family, it was in our blood. But I particularly enjoyed rock concerts. I used to blag press passes at the Hands of Odeon, and I photographed the big bands like Motorhead, Status Quo, Judas Priest, Black Sabbath, and all those big bands. Um, much to the horror of my parents, 41 years ago tomorrow, I had a conversation with my dad uh, because I had just finished my A-levels. Those of you that have uh, teenagers, that's the age. A-levels finished this week. I had just finished mine, and I wasn't planning to go to university. I wasn't planning to go to college. I was kind of thinking that I was just going to go around the world uh, listening to rock music and taking photos of bands. Uh, heavy metal in the 70s. Uh, it was a very different place than it is today, and a lot of drugs going on. Uh, and my dad just kind of looked at me in absolute horror that this is what I fancied doing. And now, we have to put this in context, in so much that my dad was a dental surgeon in private practice. His brother was a senior consultant surgeon, and his other brother was an officer in the Grenadier Guards. His dad was the worldwide CEO of the Royal Exchange. I want to remember that name. My mother was a magistrate and her dad was an engineer of considerable global repute. He invented the dimmer switch, he invented hydraulics, and he invented, bless him, the dishwasher. <laughs> so the idea that I was gonna go around taking pictures of rock bands, it just wasn't gonna happen. And my dad wandered off muttering something about, you're gonna get a proper job. So the following day, I kind of took this on board, and I went down to the Dorking Job Center, just down the road, and I had a 10 minute interview. And at the end of the 10 minutes, the uh, lady said to me, Mr. Calvert, we think you're cut out for a career in pension scheme administration. <laughs> I can get you two interviews today if you're interested. So I went down to Friends Provident at the bottom of Box Hill. They offered me a job, and I went to a company called National Employers Life, now known as Unum, to those of you that. Uh, and this was their head office, and they offered me the job, and they were closer to my house, and their free lunches looked a bit bad. So I went with them. And for six months, I did pension scheme administration. At the end of six months, my boss said to me, Mr. Calvert, we don't really think you're cut out for pension scheme administration, but we do think sales is an area that you might like to go into. I thought, I'll give that a go. And I became a broker consultant. Back then, we were called inspectors. I don't even know what they call them today. I don't even know what the you actually see them anymore. But I had a great long time, and for the next 20 years, uh, at least the next 20 years, I used to meet 20 financial advisors every single week, and I did that week after week for 20 years. I spoke at all the conferences, and I think probably still today I've probably met more financial advisors than anybody else in the entire industry. Now I really enjoyed it, but in that time, obviously my job was to try and encourage you guys to promote our products at National Employees Life. And I went on to Zurich Life later on. But talking to financial advisors over that many years, there was really interesting themes that I started to see building. But there was one big constant that kept coming up. Whatever level of financial advisor I was talking to, whether I was talking to some of the country's top financial planners or some complete newbies who were maybe just starting out doing a little bit of broking. Um, there was one constant theme, and that one constant theme was marketing, lead generation. The same question kept coming up, what's the best way to generate leads? And you can see that today as well. You've only got to go into our forum on Facebook, 
and we see every day people asking questions about what's the best way to generate leads? Should we be using unbiased? Should we be using vouched for? Should we be using somebody else? Back in the day, the number one way of generating new business was actually either referrals, quite rightly so, and I believe it still is the number one way, and seminars and workshops. And I would love to stand in front of you today and tell you the, in my view, the single best way to generate leads as a financial advisor is seminars and events. And I'll uh, put my life on that one. Most of the most successful financial advisors around the world have used seminars and events as part of their proposition in some way, shape or form. So that's kind of how it was then and how it kind of still is today. Today we've got this as well. And I look at this and I think, what a mess we have our world today. You know, I'm the first to say we should be using social media, but I'll suggest we use social media within the context of some sort of plan. Martin alluded right at the beginning there to Academy. Back in the day, we called it social networking. We didn't call it social media. In my view, we have sacrificed social networking for this thing called social media. I am gradually, slowly but surely, pulling away from social media and immersing myself much, much more in social networking, online communities, not on Facebook, not on LinkedIn, but elsewhere. The potential to be able to network with each other when you have something in common is incredibly powerful. But that's another story. It's my belief that we've got most of the leads we need right under our noses. Right under our noses. So late last year I did some research. I looked, I worked with a hundred financial advice firms and we looked at their website. And we found some amazing things. On average, out of 100 financial advisors, the average number of visits that a financial advisor gets to their website was 197. That was on average. So some are getting quite low, and some are getting really high numbers. But on average, 197. So for most financial advisors, sorry, per month, the regular one is, for most financial advisors, you know, that's a reasonable number. And for most financial advisors, particularly in the quality space, you don't really want new clients being shoveled into your business. If you want new clients being shoveled into your business by the hundreds every week, then Facebook advertising is the direction for you to go. But for most financial advisors, we just want a steady, slow, concentrated trickle of our high quality business. There was something else that I spotted when I was looking at financial advisors' websites as well was the amazing lack of knowledge of what is actually going on on your websites. Most financial advisors didn't know how many people visited their site. We had to dig around to get that 197 number. Didn't know how many pages, we didn't know which pages were being looked at, how long people were staying, what search terms were used. They didn't know this stuff. To me, this is critical management information. Whatever you do in a financial advice business, I think everyone needs to know these basic numbers. But there was another number that was even more shocking that hardly any financial advisors knew, and that was the bounce rate. The percentage number of people who arrive on your website and then leave without looking at the second page. 54% was the average. If you can have a bounce rate around 23, 25%, actually that's about right, you're doing quite well. So more than half of your website visitors are leaving without looking at the second page. If that's the average, I said some, some of them we saw them bounce rates in the high 80s percent. But the worrying thing is more that you didn't know this. Once you know it, you can do something about it. Now, I think there are reasons why the bounce rate is so bad. And I just want to look at some common themes that we saw across each of these websites. First of all, most financial advisors' websites all look the same. I'm joking about they all look the same. They all say the same thing. We have these common themes of lighthouses, uh, people sitting on beaches, uh, older folks sitting on park benches, flying kites with grandparents, with the grandchildren, uh, compasses is another big theme that we see on fire. So we all look the same, there's nothing to differentiate us. When we look at financial advisors' online profiles on LinkedIn, they all say the same thing. They literally all say the same thing. The About Us section, was the most predictable thing. I mean, I can do a party piece at some conferences where I can write the About Us section for any financial advisor in the country, and they'll be really pleased with it, and I can do it without having met them. They all say the same thing. No client video testimonials. In the speaking world, 
We live or die on video testimonials. Uh, if you want a great example of video testimonials, go check out Brian Hill's website, Jones Hill. He has a section called Client Stories. Uh, and you know, you look at those videos and you think, there's no way I'm not going to go to this for much time. So video testimonials, super important. And something else amazing that came out of research that we did, that we noticed that the average number of clickable links on the home page alone was 34. Now what's that going to do to your average visitor who visits your website? There's 34 separate calls to action. And when you think about it, it's a natural thing to do. You want to put links to the stuff that you do, your pension page, your investment page, your philosophy, the exams you pass, your about us page, your social things, your contact us. It's a natural thing to chuck it all on there. But all it serves to do is confuse people, and that's why the bounce rate is so high. And it's a simple fact of life that a confused mind will always say no. And finally, uh, this, I think it's finally a sense of value ladder. Something that when you arrive on the website, you can try before you buy. You can get a taster of what this financial advice firm is about. Absolutely no sense of value ladder on most financial advisors' websites. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that in, in a second. And finally, nothing to connect with visitors. So when I visit your website, there's nothing usually that says, oh, you're the one for me. This website screams, you're the financial advisor for me. So what I want to do is look at these three things uh, in a little bit more detail. So, first of all, the About Us page. Uh, and, and let's just put one up and show you what I mean. This is an exact copy straight off the Financial Advisors website last week. All I've done is change the name and the name of the company. Now, when we first started having websites, this is what we put on the About Us section. And for most financial advisors, this is still what we put. But as the years have progressed by, that good old fashioned concept of people by people has kicked in, so we've added a bit more. <laughs> we recognise this, don't we? Yeah? We want to give people a sense of who we are. But it's just so dark. It doesn't make you stand out from the crowd, yeah? So, I want to show you, in a second, I'm going to show you a video uh, that's been put together by a lady uh, who, called Caroline Mays, who is a professional profile writer. For whatever industry you're in, she writes a killer biography, okay? But she says the writing bit is just part of it. It's what you do next. And she advocates turning your about us bit into a video, almost like into a little mini movie about yourself, okay? Um, but she always suggests that you, before you do anything, you answer some of these questions. Now, we'll make sure that you get copies of the slides, just get in touch with me so you can get these, but I just want to put these up. Uh, these are the sort of questions that you should be asking yourself before you start writing your about us section. So, I'm going to show you now the video that Caroline has created for her About Us. So, she does a video About Us section. And I guess I'll just press this. Yes. I'm a fugitive on the map. I took off at 17 from a tiny hometown where kids fight with shards of broken mirror from their makeup faces. Thank you. 
The time is now. So keep going. And when you have blisters, the size of cortex on the backs of your heels and the band-aids keep falling off, what does a fugitive do? They wrap maxi pads around their feet with duct tape and keep running. We get creative, we find alternatives. We pick our paths and run like hell because the destiny we want isn't going to make it so. The coolest thing I've learned is that we have to tilt the circumstances to see them in their true light. That's what I do for people in their businesses so they can be fugitives, so they can keep the running strong. Service here, they really look after you 
at this level here. They even take video testimonials of you. Yes, in a dental practice. That's a dentist's value, and slowly but surely, we take people to the very, very top. What about the value ladder for a financial advisor? Does it even exist? For most financial planners, what we're expecting people to do is to pay for that, <coughs> to pay for the very top thing on your value ladder. Yet we live in an internet <coughs> age now. You know, I go back to when I first started. Uh, if you went to a dinner party, and you just have to mention around the table that, that you're looking for a financial advisor, uh, your host might say, oh, well, check out my financial advisor, Jones and Co. They're absolutely fantastic. And what you do is you write their telephone number down on the napkin. The next day, you phone them up. You'll be recommended to. These days, it doesn't work like that. You go to the dinner party, you say, I'm looking for a financial advisor, and they say, check out jonesandco.com, and you write down the website address on the napkin. What do you do next? You go Google them. And when you Google them, you find a whole bunch of other financial advisors' websites, which might be more attractive. Maybe you go and look on LinkedIn, they all do the same thing. We get distracted. We may not actually end up going to Jones & Co. So we need to be able to tease people in and give them a sense of our expertise and our value and our quality right from the start. What we shouldn't do, in my view, is expect people to go from here, where they arrive on your website, to here in one big jump. Registering for your free email newsletter is not a step on the value ladder. So what could we offer people who visit our websites for the first time? Well, I've just thrown together a whole bunch of different things that you could include on your value ladder. You don't have to offer them all, but you could certainly offer some of them. You know, right at the very bottom here, a simple E9. We've all done it, haven't we, yeah? Where we're happy to exchange our email address for a, an instant download. And the simplest thing in the world you could do is you could say uh, 10 ways for middle managers to increase their income in retirement for free. How hard is that for you to write? How hard is that for you to write? Or maybe you've got a bit of a niche. 20 ways for surgeons to increase their retirement income. What else? You could do a tips book, you could do an e-book, an actual book, an audio book, start getting into podcasting. What we're seeing here is the quality and the value is going up as is the price. So some of this stuff will be given away for free down here, but as, just think of the same Tony Robbins, as we progress up here, we are pulling people into our expertise. The trust is building, the relationship is building, the value is building along the way. Until we get to the very, very top level of your service. Only I would suggest to you that that is not the top level of your service. I think we can go a bit further. I'm starting to see financial advisors, uh, certainly uh, on the continent and in the United States, where financial advisors take it a whole lot further. But they take their best clients and say, right, we're going to have a long weekend at a nice resort, somewhere like that, and we're going to just immerse ourselves into life planning, whatever you want to immerse yourself in. We're going to do a bit of yoga, we're going to eat some nice food, we're going to do some water sports and activity, something like that. And that's taking this to a whole other level. Now, you aren't thinking, well, my clients, they're not going to do that. Trust me, there'll be clients in there who will fall over themselves to be part of your whole inner circle, if you like, that gets to go to something like this. Now, I think this is a, something that, that we should really be thinking about a bit more. I mean, let's just take our host here today, Martin. You know, he wrote these three books. Knocked them off a few years ago. They are very much part of his value ladder. Martin tells me that he still gets new clients coming in today who said, oh, I read your book 10 years ago. One of our other speakers here today has a very clear sense of a value ladder. A challenge. I love the idea of putting a challenge together. This is a great way of pulling people into your world, your expertise, building the trust, building the likability, building the reputation as well. So that's value ladders. Finally, I want to look at just uh, making our website stand out in such a way that we've got to go with this particular person. This is the financial planner for us. Now, for most of us, we are to a certain extent a needle in a haystack when it comes to people looking for financial planners. Uh, and it needn't be that way. If we can identify a niche, or we can identify an area where we have above average expertise, we can come to dominate that haystack, yeah? 
These are not niches in my views, in my view. They are kind of niches, but they're not really, they're not really focused enough. Some would argue that looking after doctors, doctors is not a niche. What do I mean? This is a niche. This is a community for gay guys who love dogs. 90,000 members around the world. Created by a guy who uh, a particular area of expertise and he realised he was gay, he loved dogs, he realised the whole community of people out there who could do this. This is an online community. It started as a Facebook group, they're now taking it off Facebook and creating a separate, separate community. How about bass fishermen as a niche? Now this one's phenomenal, you may have heard of Jared, a financial planner out in Colombia, and he literally fishes with a fish. Oh, his story is absolutely astonishing. He will only deal with clients who fish for bass. When he was a little boy, he used to go bass fishing with his dad. So there's nothing he doesn't know about bass fishing. His dad was a financial planner as well. They go to all the trade shows, they go to all the events, all the professional bass fishermen go, and he realised he was in a good place because the prize money for winning those sort of competitions was phenomenal, and they all needed help. But a bass fisherman would generally only want to go and see a financial planner with whom they had something in common, and where they knew they could be trusted. So that's literally what he does. And what he calls it is passion prospecting. So it's a great concept. Um, and you start, you ask yourself a few questions. What do you know and what do you love? It could be golf, it could be red wine, it could be cycling. It's very likely that most of you in this room have got something deep inside you that you know and that you love that you can work more on. And we hear this more and more. Uh, I've talked to a lot of financial planners who said they really want to work with clients who, as they describe them, are my kind of people. And I kind of get that. If you're going to go into this extreme mission, you've got to commit to it for three years. Now, I'm not saying right now that either you abandon your current business and start just focusing on a niche. What I'm suggesting is you start thinking about running another business or thread alongside what you actually do. It may well be that after three years, you might only have five clients in this particular niche. But it's a start, but it's a really important starting place. And you go to all their events, you go to their trade shows, and you mix and you meet people. Now what Jared did was he realised that he was starting with professional bass fishermen, then he realised that he could broaden this out, and he realised there were plenty of doctors who liked bass fishing, there were plenty of accountants who liked bass fishing, there were plenty of small business owners and entrepreneurs who liked bass fishing. So he would just broaden his niche a little bit more, to the point where he literally become their natural choice. They want to go to any other type of financial advisor. So you start with the extreme niche, and then you literally just broaden it out. So in Jared's case, start with professionals and broaden it out to anybody else who like bass fishing. You put on seminars, you put on webinars, you create niche content that is aimed solely at that particular person that you are looking at. You then start arranging very upmarket trips and events. And what Jared used to do was to arrange long weekend fishing trips. He wouldn't brand them up as the whatever the name, the name of his firm was. He was just literally putting these things on. No branding whatsoever. He knew at some point over the weekend fishing trip, people would ask him questions. Just tell us a bit more about yourself, that sort of thing. Great PR it built up as well. And you start building community. So the guy who created Dunes with Dogs, he suddenly realised, my goodness, there's a lot of other people like me, and they want to be together. So you start creating community. This is a community here today. Communities online, Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups, Reddit groups, Mighty Network groups, there's all sorts of different ways. You see, the amazing thing is, when you want to work with somebody who's just like you and share certain passions, the rapport is absolutely superb. Okay, so niching has got a kind of life cycle to it, and it works a bit like this. You're already in a broad market, but you identify areas that you really, really care about, areas that you really, really know about as well, and you get known in that particular sphere as well. You then deliberately broaden that niche out a bit more. So what Jared has now done, so he's starting with professional bass fishermen, 
He then moved into anybody who likes doing bass fishing. He now does retreats and all sorts of open air events for uh, people who just love the countryside. Where he does, people like hunting and fishing out there, so he spread it out into a slightly broader leash as well. And he says, from that come just the best possible clients you would ever want, because the relationships are so deep, the relationships are so strong, and the referrals, which is what he actually wants, ultimately at the end of the day, are even better still. So start broad, they go really tight, broaden it out a bit, love the extreme quality clients, and that's where the magic really happens. It's worth thinking about. I know for a lot of people, going into a niche market is, uh, there's a lot of fear that goes with that. So run it alongside what you do. Now what I've discovered is that people who run niche communities or have niche clients, they inevitably realize there are other ways to monetize their expertise as well. So take this one, for example. Uh, Find what feels good, Kula. Kula is the Sanskrit name for community. 90,000 people who love yoga all around the world. Started by one yoga teacher. There are thousands of yoga teachers around the world selling yoga services, but they wanted to connect with other people around the world. They created this online community for them. Uh, Founders Live is another huge network around the world for business owners, started by one guy who was just setting up business consultancy services. But he really wanted to focus on just people who found businesses, started building a community around them online. Beyond type one, diabetes community. Again, a lady who was offering health and wellness uh, courses to people, started building community around her expertise. Thousands and thousands. And finally, Hatch Tribe for kick-ass women entrepreneurs. Again, started by a lady who was offering consultancy services to female business owners, but she realized that if I really go deep in this niche, I can build it up. She's about 3,000 members, and she charges them $35 a month. So think about this. One of the things, a new common thread that I'm, when I'm meeting financial advisors now, nowadays is how do I get out of the regulated environment? What else could I do? How could I repackage my expertise and my services and so on? Building niche communities and charging people to be a member of them is a phenomenal way of doing it. And of course it creates that holy grail of recurring revenue stream. That we all want. So just to summarize, build a value ladder, think about the services you could offer, think about repackaging your expertise, how could you pull people in to start taking them up your value ladder? Think about your website biography a lot more seriously than you currently do. Even make a movie out of it and build a market niche in a community that you can grow. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated by building communities. I've been doing it for, well, since Martin mentioned the Academy days. Um, and I absolutely love it when I'm uh, doing that more and more these days. So if anybody needs any help on that, please do get in touch. In the meantime, thank you so much for your attention today. Great to see you.